Hello everyone, it's been a minute. Welcome to another episode of Africa Karifu. I hope that you and your family are doing well and that you are safe. In today's episode, we are going to talk about what has undoubtedly taken over the world as we know it, COVID-19. But we are going to look at it from the African perspective. We are going to talk about how some African countries are responding to COVID. But more specifically, we are going to see what some young people are doing to be able to help lower the curve and the spread of COVID-19 in Africa. Primarily, we will be talking about Cameroon. Before we get into today's episode, I want to remind everyone of our Instagram page at Africa Karifu. There you can see upcoming episodes as well as other relevant info that we will share. Also, do not forget to like us on whatever also do not forget to subscribe to our podcast on whatever platform you listen on and leave us a comment if you have something specific that you would like us to address at the Carrefour. When the pandemic broke out, I was very worried about most African countries and how they are going to respond to this because we do not have some of the healthcare infrastructure and facilities to be able to handle surge in hospitalization. Our guest today is going to tell us about some of the efforts that she is involved with and what her group and other young people are involved with in Cameroon to be able to help slow down the spread of the virus in Cameroon. We would also be able to get a sense of what's happening on the ground because as you guys know, government press releases and statements don't often reflect or give us a true picture of what is happening at the local level. So joining us today at the Carifu is Miss Velvita Viban. She is a young Cameroonian woman who resides in the city of Douala. She is very active in the community and involved with a lot of non-profits. So Velvita, welcome to the Carifu. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get into our conversation today, I want to give you an opportunity in your own words to describe yourself and some of the things that led to you doing what you are doing today. So first off, um, Velvita is Cameroonian, like you said, she's female. <laughs> And she originates from the northwest region of Cameroon, precisely in Salt. And born into a family of three girls, the middle girl, um, but happened to grow up as the tomboy. So most of the activities that uh, led up to where I am today was, you know, because, we, you know, the middle girl syndrome or the middle child syndrome, you're always fighting for something. Let me put it that way. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Growing up, I think as early as I was probably four or five, I remember participating in um, a poetry co uh, competition. It was Martin Luther King Day, and we had to, you know, recite all his, you know, the Martin Luther King speech. And I think that's as early as it started for me in terms of what I'm doing today, humanitarian um, action and speaking up for people and children's rights. Um, I am a bachelor's holder of law. So I, I did a bachelor's degree in law. Um, I further went on to do um, international relations, precisely um, conflict management and, um, well, a few other extra courses uh, such as project, agile project management. Um, I have worked in a couple of fields um, I started off, let me say, my first paid career because I volunteered for about three, three years uh, in a non-profit, the Cameroon Youth and Students Forum for Peace. That's where I kind of harnessed most of the skills and projects and, you know, getting insights on the things that we need to be doing as young people. Um, but I started off in my first paid career and in, 
in Diageo, Guinness, Cameroon. And I worked with, you know, high top executives. So I learned a lot of <laughs> negotiation skills, like I like to call them. Um, and then I moved from from that, that role into corporate relations where I handled employee relations. So it was a very sensitive role, especially for younger. I think I was about 26 at the time. So I had to manage people who were very old, uh, younger or, you know, so it was a mix of people management. And then you, you, there's the element of, um, um, should I say, emotional intelligence involved. So I think from there, I kind of had a wing of a sense of what I, I really was looking at doing and how I felt about helping people, solving their issues, relaying their complaints and figuring out solutions that will help them feel better more productive and all of that. So um, fast forward to uh, maybe later in 2016, I started off a nonprofit called Happy Mother, Happy Child, um, co-founded with uh, another colleague of mine. Her name is Queen Asanji. Um, we, we, you know, we just started off from, from a very little idea, as little as, you know, we realized that most of the child care conditions in Cameroon are not the best and most people cannot afford um, the basic necessities. So this was an opportunity for us to step in, help, provide as much solution as we could and, um, and you know, work on projects or initiatives that will help mothers um, um, to build um, a financially stable home. So most of the activities we do are empowerment initiatives that help women and mothers, especially the Fulani mothers and inter internally displaced mothers um, on that platform. And we've grown from there. And yeah, uh, the most recent one that I'm really working on, which is very close to my heart, started off as a movement. It's called I'm Human. And yeah, many people ask me, why not we are human? But I tell them, you know, when we generalize it, it feels like the struggle is no longer personal. So um, I'm Human started as a, as a movement to um, promote inclusive communities, especially for vulnerable groups, and creating a space where everybody feels um, accepted for who they are, regardless of what race, gender, color, religion, or you know, past history, background, wherever they come from. So okay, yeah, um, so it. yeah, thank you for for saying that. But I want us to maybe back up a little bit, and so yep. maybe people can understand uh, a little bit about uh, where you come from. So you studied law. Yes, um, I did. I know that uh, growing up in an African country, in, people always wanted to be lawyers or doctors or engineers, yes. that kind of a stuff. Yes. Um, you know, because I don't know, it, it was, it sounds prestigious, right? Then, then you, you know, you go to work for this company, but why shift from that? Why leave maybe a paid career to start to go into all of these, um, I guess, nonprofit, like what happened? Um, was it that you were not, you know, um, happy anymore working in, in the corporate setting or did you get fatigue or, or did the jobs just, I don't know, did you just grow out of them? Uh, actually, no. Uh, what happened was, um, you know how the corporate world works. So there was an organization, uh, we call it the OE. So there was, a, there was a shift, there was a change. They were, you know, laying off jobs. Mm -hmm. So uh, my role was one of the targeted roles because I was a junior executive. So it was very easy. I had not been in the company for more than five years. So it was easy, you know. And uh, I guess my role, should I say, was one of those who were going to get according to the long-term plan, was going to disappear in, I think, about eight months. So yeah. it was a decision of whether or not to hang in there for another eight months and then uh, just be hanging. Or it was a decision of, okay, um, here's what it is. You can take it from there and leave. From a personal perspective, um, when I started working in the corporate world, I had not, um, and I always tell people this, I had not say defended my master's th thesis. So I got caught up, I got carried away by the glitz and glam. I was making bare cash. I almost forgot that, you know, school was pending. So I needed to finish that off. I mean, I had done the full term schooling, but I just not defended my master's thesis. So I had to 
um, at that point in time, make that decision that, hey, I need to focus and clear this out of the way so that it gives me more leverage um, to continue my life however I want it without, you know, leaving some stones. Um, yeah. On current. Yes. So this is a very important point and one which I'm sure a lot of uh, young Africans uh, face. You, I guess, foresaw uh, a writing on the wall, but uh -huh. decided to channel your energy into something positive and not just it maybe stay at home and just be whiny yeah. and sad and moody and all of that stuff so yeah. okay that, that's good and now you go to start a non-profit happy mother mm -hmm. happy child and mm -hmm. you mentioned that uh, your first uh targeted group i guess with the full women i mean yeah. this is uh I mean, do you live around full of women? I mean, you know, why the, the full of women as your first sort of like uh, people group to, to work with or to target? Yeah, actually, when I was growing up, um, the ladies that used to, there's this lady, she was called um, Fatima. She used to braid her hair. So, um, you know, they always came around and I always wondered, is this all these ladies do? And this was a life for them. They just, you know, pick on the least less of jobs and they had the you know these women had children like every time she came home there was another new baby and i was just like ah, i don't understand you guys just you know is this a tradition so i kind of got intrigued style their pra you know their belief systems what is it about them that allows them to stay in these circles and not blossom into everybody else chasing some form of, I don't know, business idea or something. So I think from there, I kind of developed, you know, that element of, okay, I need to understand these people. So when we started off Happy Mother, Happy Child, it was more of a perspective of who my first mothers or target group be. This, were easier, this was easier for me because now it would have brought me closer to them to understand what it was about their lifestyle, what it was about the things they wanted to do and couldn't do, and how I could actually, at this point in time, help them and not just you know contribute to them being the same people that i've been seeing growing up mm -hmm. so that's where, that's where you know the first should i say we we sprung from it was from a personal angle trying to help you know a story a story a narrative that i've personally with this is a good point especially for those who may not have the context of growing up in an african society there are many times where women just keep on giving birth and as uh -huh. a child you know just really one after another it's like their baby manufacturing machines and it's good to hear that the focus of your first non-profit was for women especially these Fulani women who kept on giving birth to children and had very little support from for themselves and for their children but now you have this going on for you and it seems to be going on fine. Why then decide to add this second portfolio of another nonprofit, I Am Human? So basically, um, Happy Mother, Happy Child is a specific, is a target group of people, is mothers and children. But the I'm Human movement came up from, like I said, it was more of I was dealing with a lot of personal struggles. I was trying to find my way. I was trying to find my path, you know, you're dealing with having to make certain decisions. And I think everybody goes through some phase in their life where they, you know, their brains are thinking, re-strategizing, finding your purpose. And this was more from a perspective of all the struggles that I, I had been through and just in life that, I, you know, the things I had to experience and I realized that as I went on doing all the different activities that I've been doing, regardless of whether Happy Mother, Happy Child came into the picture or not, even if it was just from, you know, my corporate experience, everybody at some point in their life would, wants to feel accepted and wanted and acknowledged. And that's the end goal. Like, I realized that that's the end goal. Like, regardless of whether, you know, there's this sense of, belonging that we all want to to have and nobody wants to feel like because of something that happened or because of you know one or two or three or four the items or elements and as we call them labels um they don't they feel left out or they feel 
discriminated against. And I come from, you know, a, you know, a, 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 a country where you know, there's a lot going on now. Everybody wants to feel um, already like they've, they've, they've worked so hard for where they're going to, but they're not getting there. And then having to be from, uh, let me say, the, the minority group, there are other elements that are added onto it. And then having to be, I mean, I always say what's harder to be, um, is it being, I don't know if it's being born African, if it's being born Black African, if it's being born female Black and African, if it's being born Cameroonian Black and, you know, all of that. Or is it actually, I mean, there's just a lot. Or, and on top of that, I have to be born in the English-speaking region of Cameroon. Like, how many extra things do I have to carry to prove myself? So, um from 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 that perspective, I was like, I mean, if I remove everything else, I'm just as good as everybody else. I'm just as human as you are. I don't. You might be wealthy. I'm not. You 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 know. I might have a little more advantages than you have, but that doesn't mean that we all are not the same people. So it was more of a movement. Um, mm -hmm. It started off, like I said, as a movement where we can voice out our personal struggles. We can talk about the taboos, the things that people are not talking about, the pain points and the pain issues that everybody's dealing with, and how we can make you feel better about them. So okay. that, that, yeah, so that is where it kind of stemmed off from. I could tell from your voice and the emotion as, as you were speaking that um, I am human came from something very deep and something very personal to you. Growing up in Cameroon, and growing up in, in any African country, the way women are treated, and even right now in a country, Cameroon, the marginalization of the English-speaking Cameroonians had gotten to a level that it has now led to this civil unrest. There's a lot of uncertainty. So there's all these things happening in the country, and there's all this context. But I am, again, still impressed that rather than just sit at home and complain and whine about stuff, you guys decided to rise up, step up, get a movement, and just start to see how you can be agents of change in the society, in the community. So now let us, um, you know, fast forward and let's talk about COVID. COVID has now break on. Let's get back to when COVID hit. Uh, Cameroon. Um, yeah. I had some friends here in America and as COVID hit, we started talking about it and there was some skepticism that this doesn't affect black people. Right. Um, so what, what was like the reaction on the ground there when this thing hit? Like um, how did people respond? Like the everyday person on the street? It's really interesting because I happen to move a lot in Douala in a city like Douala that is so upbeat and you get to you know, you get to meet all kinds of people, the bike riders, the taxi men, the ones that are just selling on the roadside. And those are the people who actually hold opinions. You be, you, you know, people, those people have strong opinions and um, <laughs> they, they just did not believe. Like I remember having a comment and in French, they say maladie de blanc, mm -hmm. which is a white man's sickness. Yeah. And they're like, oh, please, that does not concern us. True enough, you know, the government was, you know, um, I think what happened, I think the first week was, you know, they just made an announcement, but it was more of reporting on on how it was happening outside of Cameroon. They didn't create, I don't think they created any kind of severity to it. So it didn't feel like it was something that big of an issue. And mm -hmm. I remember I started off with two cases from two, I mean, from the reports, I think I started following really keenly. I started off with just two cases who happened to come on some flight, I think it was an Air France flight at the time. Um, and then um, they, they, I know, you know, Cameroonians are very funny. They cracked the joke. Oh, we need to track them down to their families and anybody who came in contact with them. And everybody was like, how are we going to do that? Explain to us. But before we knew it, it became five the next day or next two days. So it still looked like it wasn't 
our thing. And we were hearing the numbers from China, from from Italy. It was looking really bad elsewhere. But to us, it was like, oh, oh well, we're still fine. Unfortunately, borders didn't close up until maybe the cases went above 10 or so. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it's interesting how for viruses like this, one person can spread to, I don't know, a hundred. But, you know, the ripple effect is so, is so large. So I, I remember having a conversation with, um, um, in a, in a, I took a, I, I grabbed a taxi. I think I was going to town and I was really sitting at the edge and I was wearing my mask. And the guy was saying, ah. he asked me, why are you looking like I have COVID? So I said, you don't have to have it or you don't have to know. I don't know who was in this taxi before me. And he's like, oh, no, please. I do not carry any foreigners or <clears throat> I, I do not. Yeah, I don't I don't work with, um, you know, I don't work with people. I don't pick up people from the airport. You know, you know, the stick, the, 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 the like you're explaining it. People didn't believe that it was it was a thing. And up until now, there are still a lot of people who think it's it's just um, a political farce or something. It's just a game of I don't know powers, yeah. and, and 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 it really does not concern us. And I remember asking somebody, um, maybe like two weeks into the whole COVID started growing in Cameroon, and I said, "Do you know somebody who has COVID?" And they said, "No." And then I said, "Okay, do you know of somebody who knows somebody who had COVID?" And they said, "No." And then I was like, "Okay, so." These numbers they're reporting of people dying. How comes you no know, nobody knows somebody? And and we we joked about it, but then the very next day, I had a case, and I was like, okay, okay, guys, this is serious. But until it comes close to you, it it almost feels like it's just news. Uh-huh. So a lot of people in Cameroon in particular are just living by the news and they really don't want to have it because you're telling them, don't go to work, don't go. I'm, we're, we're struggling. It's a really struggling economy. People are struggling to make meals for their families. So you telling them, don't go out, stay indoors. To them, they're like, please don't come and tell me about some foreign illness that we don't even know who has it. It's for rich people. It's not for us. Let them yeah. Their issues let us handle ours. So, I mean, that is, I mean, you saying that, I, I guess it also was some of my first thoughts, right? This is yes. maybe uh, a disease for the affluent, those that have traveled, but now we see that it, it has gotten into our market, it's on our streets, mm-hmm. and people are now affected. Yes. And to make even uh, matters worse, we are in an interesting time in Cameroon's history where we have this conflict, internal conflict between, you know, the marginalization of English-speaking Cameroonians vis-a-vis how yeah. the government is doing. So we have a lot of internally displaced people. So yes. how then did your group now step in? You know, what are some of the things that you guys decided to start to do now, given everything that's happening? So if you look at it, right, most of these internally displaced people um, are already dealing with a lot. Um, You'd hear some of the stories. um, Unfortunately, I cannot share them, but they're really gruesome stories. You'd hear some of them. And you're asking yourself, how are these people even surviving? How did they get here? Some of them um, actually walked to get to, to, to the city area where they can find some form of subsistence or life or whatever. And it's already hard leaving everything that you own behind and starting off from scratch. So if you're coming to, let's say, a, um, let me just say a community like a city like Douala, you, you, life here is already expensive. So how do you have a house? How do you live? How, you know, all of that. So they end up living in this really clustered units where a home which has a single bedroom, for instance, has roughly about 11 to 15 people living there. Hmm. Because obviously they're trying to, you know, it's it's like, I mean, we say misery likes company. So, you know, you, you find so this, knowing that this is your fellow brother who's also run like you from 
the 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 the, the conflict areas and they're trying to seek some form of shelter elsewhere. So they yeah. tend to live a lot in cluster units. And to them, to most of them, they don't have any jobs. They're still struggling to start off. The prostitution levels are sh- like are off the chart now, but um, because they are just trying to make ends meet. But you know, having to deal with all of that, and then COVID comes into the picture. You don't have any form of financing. Like I say, people live below a dollar. How are you going to feed yourself, feed your family, and then have to buy a nose mask? Uh, you go to a pharmacy, and nose mask is 1,000 francs CFA, and it's a disposable mask, which is about $2. If I'm making less than a dollar a day, how am I supposed to buy a disposable mask that costs about $2 and still feed my family and still take care of you know the other things? So our group really was from the perspective of these same people walk into this, you know, into the, the areas that we go to, the local market store, I want to buy food. This is probably the person I'll be buying from. So if I'm not helping you to stop the spread, I might as well pick it up from you because I don't know who else is coming to buy from you. Who mm-hmm. else, you know, if you're only a local business or a shop or something, walk in there. So that person is, although you're thinking of it from a perspective of, ah, well, we might not be helping them, but you are helping yourself. You're actually helping the spread. So if you're reducing it for them, you're reducing it for many others who come in contact with this, this person. But also, you're also helping them, you know, in, in, in need because they really need that help at that point in time. So we were really just trying to develop um, a, res- a crisis response project that would help these communities to reduce the spread amongst themselves because if you're living in a cluster home with all those kind of 11th, you don't have, most of those communities where they live do not have water as in a running tap. So how is washing your hands possible? Okay, yeah. let's take washing hands out of the picture. If you have to buy hand sanitizer and a nose mask and you're really, don't, you really don't have, that's a luxury, right? So mm-hmm. I'm not going to be doing that so what this means is, for those kind of groups, the chances of the COVID spreading like in a split second is so easy. They will just sit there and one guy comes home and the rest is history for all of them. Yeah. So what then are we doing, uh, you know, like for community workers like myself and other organizations on the ground, it was more of how are we helping them to respond to this crisis and also help the numbers to not skyrocket out of what they already are now. Yeah, so this is a a brilliant idea, right? Knowing that if we do not step in to help the vulnerable amongst us, then mm-hmm. if they get the disease, it's just going to spread like rapid, you know, wildfire because they are in clusters and who knows it if they get it, then I get it. And so Whatever yeah. I can do to be able to help control that for them, in a sense, mm-hmm. I am helping control its rate of which it might get to me. Yes. Now, with you guys doing all of that, do you get some support from like maybe the government? You know, were you guys, um, were the government like, oh, you know, this is, this is great. You know, we're going to help you guys do this because we are not able to do this. The first project when we started off was based off on just a conversation that happened with, let me say, a couple of AMSAF colleagues. And yeah. it was more like, how do we just, you know, help the group that we know and that we can just work with. So when we, took, when we, when we, run, when, when we run the numbers, it was like, you know, it didn't come down to a lot for, for people like us. And you, you do not imagine how much just the little... Um, just a little support goes a long way for these groups. So we knew that if we had to focus on, say, governmental support or international support coming in, this would take a long time. And we're in a crisis, right? Mm-hmm. We, we have to, if we have to stop this thing or help reduce the curve, we have to start acting immediately. So if we cannot wait, say, three weeks, four months until procedures get signed up, until, you know, the government starts sending in, you know, some kind of support, 
drawing up the budget, which is normal. That's, that's administrative procedure. But for a crisis, it's really about the community organizations that are on ground that can act then and now to help, you know, while waiting for um, any form of external support. The government, in our case, for instance, focused a lot on building, on infrastructure, or at least the test kits and all of that. Because when, you know, the COVID cases started rising, there were not even test kits. There were not trained personnel. There were not equipment, you know, safety equipment for these people. So most of the support we had to go towards that because, I mean, it's but normal. So what then, like we're explaining, what more of these grassroots communities will never get to? you know, have a piece of that cake. Yeah, but you know. it is, it, it's fine and good for the government to be able to build this infrastructure because in case, yes. you know, there's a spike, people coming, but it is surprising to me that there's really no then support to prevent. I mean, I guess there's this, I'm not a medical expert, but prevention, mm -hmm. they say, is always better. That way yeah. you don't have to clog the medical system. So mm -hmm. you guys just decided to start this stuff um, on your own and yes. then you know so uh, have you guys then since you started this you know get mm -hmm. any support um or um it's still just you know you guys i guess doing it again from the grassroots so when we started it off the idea was to target just four communities and to set up four um, water dispensing units and soaps and sanitizers just for these groups of people but mm -hmm. once we started off and you know we started sharing our communications and the stories and the number and the number of people who were now depending on us um we started having a little more support from still individual support i would like to term it we did not have any major um, institution calling us to say hey you know you can you can benefit from so so and so grants. Um, I like to say that it, it it was a frustration for us, and I think for most of the the nonprofits or um, or community organizations that have been trying to support um, 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 the COVID response for vulnerable groups, because um, I think right about maybe the second or third week, they there was a whole. Um, um, communicate that went out on receiving support and people were raising using using COVID to make um, money. So the laws, you know, the rules, you know, uh, became a lot more tight. Um, you know, the the government sent out you know warnings and all of that just to say. So if you were actually working on a project like this, you either already had generated the funds or you had to genuinely prove where and why those funds were coming in and that was it when i think about it it was going to cost us even more cases so, yeah yeah so the time like i said it's a crisis and um it's just sad to say where where i live for being where i am we're still so slow on crisis response because you know, we have to think about it from a perspective of these are grassroots organizations who are touching the masses. So it's, I like that you asked that, does the government do anything? Because the government is meant to be looking out for these organizations that already have these groups that they can reach and, you know, say, okay, I cannot personally reach these communities, but you already can reach these communities. So I'm going to, because I want to help stop the spread, I'm going to, you know, probably make a donation to your structure that you can transfer it down to this set of people. But unfortunately, okay, so that did not happen for most of the organizations I know. I don't know about others, but for those I know, no. Yeah, I, I like having these conversations because it is one thing when you listen to the news media or you listen to the ministers online, they will give you numbers, oh, we're doing that. But you know, once we get to talk to those on the ground where the rubber meets the road, then mm -hmm. we really get to understand some of the situation and the things that are missing now. Um, my question to you is, you know, we might have folks that are listening and they're like, oh, okay, how can people support some of what you guys are doing? Is there a place where you can direct them to so that they can be able to, um, you know, in their only two way, uh, provide some support for you guys to be able to help with uh, the efforts you're doing to, I guess, help prevent 
the, sure. the spread. Sure. Um, when we started, because it was just a local project, we didn't think about you know the extent, the extensive nature of how the support was going to start coming in. But um, as people started asking, um, we did set up different um, platforms, which enabled us to to um, to receive some little donations from people. So we did have like a, a, a PayPal platform that we set up on our website, www. Um, human with two ends dot org um, where we could you know receive funds but like I explained to you um, the because of the restrictions that came out at some point we, we those those any form of funding that was coming from outside had to be suspended so uh, it was actually a major challenge for us so um, but um, but fortunately what we do is you can actually get in contact to with us through our uh, different social media platforms. We're on social media, on Facebook and Instagram, I'm human, uh, org, I-M-H-U-M-A-N-O-R-G, in one word. Um, and, and people write to us on, you know, write to us on those platforms, and then we give them um, procedures that they can follow to, for international transfers, we prefer to use world remits because we have been able to link that to um, our local mobile money payment platform here. So for cash transfers, they come in through that way. Now for for um, um, material support, we've had quite some support from another organization called Youth for Change. Um, they, you know, they supported us with um, some um, soap, hand sanitizers, and especially education material for orphanage children who were out of school. Because now, obviously, there's this education aspect of it. Most of these groups are not going to school. What are we doing to help them um, improve their education while the, the lockdown continues? So that was another form of support that we were receiving. That is good. I hope that uh, um, f- some folks that are listening or the folks that are listening will be able to be channel in some support to you guys. Now, um, long term, what are some things that you guys see um, with this response or what you guys have planned to be able to happen uh, long term? So for us, it's actually on two key areas. We're going to be focusing on um, financial empowerment and education as well. So long term, we have a project ongoing, which is um, Safe Spaces for Healing and Empowerment. But under that, we have what we call um, skill set trainings. So for most of these groups, like the internally displaced women and mothers, who are struggling to learn a skill, get financially stable. We're going to be taking, um, in partnership with other organizations on ground, well, they're going to be taking, you know, skill set trainings. Some of them are going to be learning tech skills. Um, very important. Now, whether we like it or not, the world is going in that direction and we cannot leave them out. Uh, and then some of them will be taking um, secretarial lessons to help, especially, you know, like basic work in cyber cafes or just printouts of documents, translation, things that they can, skills that they can monetize without necessarily having a full time paid job, which is already hard for them, especially if they're school dropouts. On that aspect, that's how we're thinking long term. So, this is a project that's going to run. Um, probably we start from the end of July. Hopefully, if the we don't know how the government is going to ease out. So if they don't ease out or open up the borders, it's, we'll, we'll just, whatever happens, because things can change. But the plan is to start from the end of July. 
Um, then on the education aspect of it, which is, you know, very, very sensitive and close to my heart, is because, you know, we've realized that in Cameroon, for instance, the internet is on its own on its own trail. So we're mm-hmm. trying to have conversations that would include um, network providers because these are the people who actually need to help us. If you check the statistics, about 80% of people don't have a stable internet connection in Cameroon. And about that same number or more do not even have access to a computer. So if we're going to be talking about distance learning and all of that, and you know, with the whole COVID thing going on, people are not going to school, chances are there are a large group of children, especially those who are already struggling to be or be be in school or pick, pay cannot even afford regular tuition to stay in school, those people are going to be just out of school. What this means is that those same numbers that we're trying to help in terms of education, um, closing the educational gap, are going to, you know, it's going to widen even further. So this is this is really bad in my, when I look at it long, long term, this is this is catastrophic because we're, we're struggling already. And then being from the English speaking part where for over two years, schools have been I don't even know, more than two years. It's been, what, in November this year, it's probably going to be four years. But it's been up and down, in and out. People are not even sure whether they're in school today. So the, these people are already at, on a disadvantage for, for how many years now? So what this means is that these communities and these cities that have such people are going to, con- they'll be behind, like way behind. The train is going to take off and leave them behind. So if we're not stepping in to, to closing the gap as much as we can through our educational programs and support groups and figuring out alternative learning measures for them, then um, when the internet, you know, probably even when they get access to internet, they'll still have a lot to catch up with. But we're hoping that service providers like MTN, Nextel, Orange, can alleviate some of the charges for some of these areas and create more access to internet or at least centers or hubs that can allow for, you know, online and distance learning. It's going to take a long time to phase out because our teachers are not yet trained in that domain to teach from far, but there's a lot of policy change, um, um, policies that have to come into place. And that's where I think most of, hopefully my organization and the rest on ground will be able to lobby for a shift in, um, you know, how the education system works and how it can close up some of these gaps for these people. So those are long-term where we're looking at the kind of projects and kind of lobbying that we'll be doing. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much for sharing all of this with us. Um, at least for me personally, it is. Um, I love to hear the stories on the ground, and it is a good reminder that despite what is happening in the world and in society right now, we have a lot of young people that are stepping up, they're rising up, and not um, just sitting down at home and just complaining about what our governments are doing or are not doing. Yeah. Uh, so this has been um, a very encouraging, at least for me. Uh, especially, uh, you know, in Cameroon, I, I, I just want to always know what's happening on the ground and what are some things people are doing and how it is that um, we can be able to to support them. So thank you guys. Uh, thank you very much and your group for what you guys are doing um, because you are uh, getting into places that even maybe and connecting with people that the governments are not, you know, they're not on the radar of the governments, people that, you know, society has just you know, to society, they don't matter. But um, if we're not able to really take care of the less fortunate amongst us, then we are just, um, I mean, then as a society, we have somehow lost some level of morality. Yes, I'd agree with you. So, I mean, just one closing thought here for us. Um, How has all of this, uh, your involvement in all of this work, how has it impacted you on a personal level? Um, it, it, it's interesting you asked that question because I had the conversation yesterday and somebody was asking me, how am I feeling amidst COVID? To be very fair, uh, as much as it has been, it has been an eye-opener for things that really 
do not matter. Like, you know, I've learned, you know, just some things really don't matter. You know, at the end of the day, it comes down to basic things. Um, but on the, on the personal level, um, it has proven to me that uh, if you, if you think of, of helping people, you just start. Mm-hmm. And once you start, then you figure your way out as you go. Because I think one of the issues we've had, especially as young people and, you know, as a woman, you get told too many things that you cannot do or be safe. You can really not be too safe. But when it's about reaching out, like you said, to the communities and being each other's keepers, when I talk to some of these people, I almost, you can't come home and sleep. So mm-hmm. for me, I can't, I lost my sleep. Like I lost my sleep trying to you know, think about the things that I'm not, I'm, I could be doing. And, and I've really, you know, invested, I, I don't think in, in this short space of time, let me put it that way, I've probably done way, way much than I would have done if I was phasing out normally. Like in normal times, you plan, you, you know, you, you calculate before you execute. So for, from a personal standpoint, it has taught me to be very, very agile and to think about it from the perspective of how am I helping people to help me too. So, yeah, yeah so that, that was where I was really focusing on. And I've, I've, I've grown, I'd say I've developed a new family with some of these people now. Some of them call me just to say, hi, are you yeah. okay? Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's anything that, that can beat that at the end of the day, whether, whether or not, you know, whether or not there's some financial gain that comes from it. Just the fact that you've created a family that believes and hangs onto some level of hope that you're giving them. It's, it's epic. It's, it's an, an indescribable feeling. Yeah. But Vita, thank you very much. And uh, it is young people like you that um, would uh, move our continent forward and our country forward. So thank you very much for all that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope that you've been inspired just like I have been by listening to Velvita share her story and her journey in the world of nonprofit. I encourage you to visit them on their social media handles that she provided and see how you can help partner with them and support some of their efforts, be it for COVID-19 or other efforts that they have post-COVID-19. Until next time, thank you for joining us at the Carrefour.